I'm Sarah Wilson and you're listening to the Roots and All podcast. I'm here to help you get growing. Join me as I explore everything plant related both indoors and out and provide the information you need to create your perfect green environment. Hello and welcome to this week's episode of the podcast. This week I'm talking with Jeff Dan. Jeff is a Hastings-based forager with a vast and by the sounds of it fairly unique understanding of the mushrooms that grow in our landscape and he's also the author of Edible Mushrooms. I was very privileged to accompany Jeff to one of his foraging sites where we hunted for supplies that would either be cooked or used as examples to show attendees on the course he was running the following day. We took a walk around a mainly pine woodland where we found penny buns, pied de mouton, suede bolites, cauliflower fungus, fly agarics, parasol mushrooms, burnt knights, slippery jacks, hedgehogs and the miller to name just a few. Seemingly everywhere we looked were mushrooms bursting forth. Then it was back to Jeff's where he cooked me some of the penny buns to eat, which tasted like no other mushroom I've eaten before, in a good way. Jeff is a pioneer because many of the mushrooms in his book were not classified as edible and he's taken on the role of a well-informed and cautious taster but nonetheless has been a human guinea pig in many instances. As he mentions, his book is without parallel in terms of classifying the edibility of our mushrooms and is the bible for foragers. I started by asking him about the start of his mushroom foraging career. When you started out foraging for mushrooms... um, it seems there was a dearth of information on the topic, particularly in the UK. Um, did we lose touch with our ability to forage for mushrooms, or did we never really go in for eating them in the UK? Historically, we never ate them. Um, yeah, there's no, there's no historical record of, of the British particularly eating wild mushrooms at all, really. A few species, but not very many, certainly very few compared to European cultures. That, that, that were really into it, the mycophilic cultures um, of um, Southern Europe, um, especially Italy um, and the Slavic um, speaking nations who, who have always eaten a much wider variety of, of different sorts of wild fungi. And why were we scared of them? Um, nobody knows. Uh, one theory is that it was to do with the, the druids who kind of kept all the kind of knowledge about mushrooms because they were using the hallucinogenic varieties. And uh, yeah, uh, the rest of the population were just basically scared of them. Um, they didn't know which ones were poisonous, which ones were hallucinogenic and which ones were edible. And so they just stayed away from all of them, really. I know it's probably a difficult thing to... Just, well, no, maybe it's not because you went off and did it on your own. You self-taught um, around edible mushrooms. But if someone was starting to look at, to do it, what would be the best way into it for them? Well, it's different now. Um, and so when I started to do it, um, a book had just come out in the ni- 1980s, um, Roger Phillips' Mushrooms, which since became kind of the Bible. That book... It was not aimed at foragers in particular, but it did have some sort of edibility and it had 1,250 species in it, uh, sorry, and some edibility information, edible, not edible, poisonous, edibility unknown, just the basic information. But it had lots of species in it that were of no interest um, to to a forager because they just belonged to a big group of inedible poisonous mushrooms. So that was enough to, to kind of get someone started, but the information in that book really isn't it's not entirely accurate and it's not supposed to be aimed at foragers so I'm not criticising Roger Phillips but it, it, you know it wasn't enough it wasn't a bible for foragers it was just something to to get you started but there was no internet and there weren't very many people running courses so I just had to learn slowly myself very carefully there's all sorts of ways of doing it now um, there's better books out there uh, and of course there's the internet uh, and there's people running courses. I would just say be careful of, of the internet because there's lots of different places on the internet where you can go and try and get mushrooms identified and, um, shall we say, different cultures in different Facebook groups, some of which are more helpful than others. And there's also quite a lot of people out there who will quite happily wrongly identify your mushroom. Um, and they won't just say, I think it's it's this. They will They will just say, yes, it's it's that um and and they've got it wrong and of course it's not them who's eating it uh so 
yeah, beware of, of the internet, as you probably beware of the internet in, in all respects. The, the, the truth is, if you're going to eat something, you have got to know what it is. Don't rely on somebody else's internet identification of a mushroom. Wow, definitely. <laughs> That's <laughs> terrifying. Um, and also, I think you mentioned in your book, there is the possibility if you were overseas, that there are some real lookalikes that you need to be aware of. Well, well, that is a trap when people are, are foraging in a, in a foreign land. Um, the classic example is, is of, of, of the death cap, which doesn't grow in Asia. And so Asian people come here and there is a popular mushroom in Asia that looks quite similar to a, a, a death cap, a cultivated mushroom called a paddy straw mushroom. And they don't, they just don't know about death caps because they don't, they don't grow in Southeast Asia and they come here and, and yeah, because, because they've learnt in, in another part of the world, they're not prepared for that species. Um, there's another one in North America called a green spored parasol, which causes most, well, it's common pretty much everywhere but Europe. Um, and it's responsible for the, the biggest number of poisonings in North America. Um, and so North Americans know it. But it looks like two very edible European species of um, the shaggy parasol and the parasol. And so Europeans going to America who are unaware of that often fall into that trap. Fortunately, they don't die. But yeah, it's very difficult to be knowledgeable of, of, of mushrooms everywhere. So yeah, if, if you're outside your home territory, beware. Mm. I probably should have asked you this to start with, but how many mushroom species are there in the UK? And of those, how many are potentially poisonous or deadly even uh well it depends how you count them um i think usually people count between ten thousand and fifteen thousand. but it depends whether you count all the microscopic ones of those perhaps 500 are known to be edible maybe 300 are known to be poisonous although only kind of 10 or 20 are really dangerous uh, and the vast majority are of unknown edibility and also not very common. I mean, to give you an example, Cortinarius is the biggest genus of mushrooms in the world, 2,000 in just in one genus. Uh, maybe 100, 150 in this country, a lot of them are rare. Two or three of them known to be deadly, but the vast majority of them you're never even going to see. Um, you know, there are very few records of them. Uh, any of them could be poisonous. Now, a lot of them are poisonous. But, you know, this is just, from a foraging point of view, you just need to learn to recognise that genus and stay away from it. And what are some of the easiest mushrooms to forage for? Some are completely unmistakable. Um, I'd say two, two good examples. One is a giant puffball, which, which is just, you know, it looks like an enormous football. And they can, they can go to a metre and a half across, more typically... 30 centimetres, 40 centimetres, but there's nothing else, well, maybe 50 centimetres, nothing else grows that big. Or a, a cauliflower fungus, which, again, is about the size of a football and looks like a, a cross between a cauliflower and a brain. It's pretty distinctive. It's, you know, it has a slightly rarer relative, but that's edible too. Um, yeah, there are, there are species like that which are so distinct for one reason or another or, or so unlike anything that's poisonous that, that you really can't get into into trouble with them although having said that uh, there have been some cases of uh, i mean there's a very probably the most famous edible mushroom in the world is a sep or a penny bun which is a belete which means it's got pores instead of gills underneath the cap it's got a kind of spongy stuff and there's a, a very famous ca case of, of, of a guy called um, Nicholas Evans, author of The Horse Whisperer, who um, managed to pick some poisonous cortinarius and think that they were a penny bun. But these have gills. So this is a, a kind of like mixing up a lemon and an apple, you know. But somebody did it. So if you're not paying attention... You can you can even you know, make a mistake on that scale. You you have got to be paying attention. He was it, seriously ill, wasn't he? He needed, ended up needing a kidney transplant. His daughter gave him a kidney transplant. God, that's terrible. So, well, actually, talking about spores, I, uh, one of the interesting things I read in your book was about taking spore prints, which sounds fascinating. Um, but what does that involve, and and what are some of the, are there any outlandish colours that you might see when you do one of those prints? Uh, no, not any really outlandish colours. Um, 
To take a spore print, you just kind of detach the cap from the stem and place the mushroom on, a, on, a, on either a white surface or a black surface and leave it overnight and the spores will, will come down and you just end up with a pattern. And that can be useful either if you've got no idea what something is and you, you want to kind of narrow, kind of rule some things out or, or if you think it might belong to one group or another group and they've got, you know, uh, whether it's a brown spore print or a white spore print, we'll tell you which group it belongs to. And there are in some cases um, big complicated genuses, uh, genera, genera um, like Russula, where there's about 60 or 70 in the UK and their spore prints, well, they're very difficult to tell apart. Um, and it's off, quite often you need a microscope to look, look at their um, reproductive structures microscopically. But the, the spore prints range from white to cream. And so you've got these kind of descriptions of kind of off yellow, white, cream, slightly pinky cream, uh, which, which sometimes will enable you to, t to distinguish between two otherwise very similar species. Mm, I asked because obviously some of the mushrooms themselves have got quite unusual colours. So I wondered if the spores followed suit. Talking about people going out and making mistakes as well, um, there are many rules of thumb surrounding mushrooms that you mention in your book and that you expose as, as false. Um, and one of the ones that you didn't mention, but I have heard, is that raw mushrooms are carcinogenic. Is that true or is that another bit of misinformation? Um, no, I hadn't heard that. Um, there probably are some mushrooms which are well there are, there are there's a, a milk cap called an ugly milk cap and it deserves its name which is is carcinogenic um although it's still eaten in russia um, and the russians believe that that you can boil it and throw away the water and that renders it safe it's now known that every time you boil it it just gets rid of 50 percent of the carcinogens but it never gets rid of all of it so that is an example of a mushroom that, that, that's certainly more carcinogenic until it's been properly prepared. But there are probably others as well. And then in, there are certainly plenty of mushrooms which are poisonous, raw, but edible cooked for one reason or another. Not necessarily carcinogenic, but yeah, there's, there's various sorts of toxins which are either broken down through long cooking or if they reach a certain temperature or they can be boiled and they're, they're water soluble so they, they can be, you know, they can be boiled and, and the water thrown away mm. and also i think you mentioned about the common puffball which accumulates heavy metals is that a problem for many of the mushrooms uh quite a few of them yes and in fact they're used to clean up polluted areas um mushrooms in general kind of are quite good at, at soaking up um trace elements from from their surroundings uh, and certainly sp specific mushrooms can I've, I've got a particular talent for, for soaking up um, uh, particular chemicals like for example we just went out to, to look at mushrooms and you found a, a beautiful purple mushroom called an amethyst deceiver that picks up mercury from its surroundings and mercury which is used for example in some compounds in wood preservation chemicals so if it's growing near a fence that someone's used wood preserving chemicals on that mushroom might have dangerous levels of mercury in it wow who knew so they do actually use them to clean up contamination. yes there, there, there has been uh, experiments successful um suggesting that, that, that this does work and, and, and this is one way of, of, of cleaning up contaminated land. Mm. So what are the most common habitats that you might find mushrooms growing in or is there no such thing? Mushrooms grow on all sorts of habitats. You know, Woodland has got a wider variety of mushrooms in because it's got a wider variety of microhabitats or different sorts of wood, diff different sorts of, yeah, you, know, you can just imagine a woodland. It's, it's a lot more varied than a field. Um, but mushrooms grow in all sorts of places. Something called cellar cup, which grows in out of mortar. Um, there's mushrooms that grow on human bodies. You know, well, not mushrooms. Well, there is one mushroom actually that if you um, if you smell it, it's called a, a split gill. And if you sniff it, you know, and you're unlucky, it will it would it will kind of the spore will start growing in your nasal cavity and could cause 
problems in sinusitis and in severe cases has grown into people's brains and causes, causes a, a, yeah, irritation in the brain. No wonder we were terrified of them. <laughs> um, I thought it was really interesting what you were saying about the um, mushrooms growing along the roadside verges. Um, and I've certainly seen a lot this year. But and, I, and my first thought when I read that question was, well, how would they get there? And then you answered it in your book. But can you just kind of tell people how they might yes. get there? Yes, well, they're usually saprophytes, so they're not symbiotic with trees, although some of them are, but particularly saprophytes, and particularly uh, mushrooms that um, naturally evolved to grow near the sea, so they can tolerate a, a, a saline environment. Which, and then this is the same with a lot of, of plants that you'll find growing in the central reservation of a motorway. They, they were originally um, you know, coastal plants. Um, uh, so, that, A, that's their habitat because roads are salted in the winter, but, but they are being spread around by car tyres. So the spores spread themselves all over the road. Then when it's wet, the, a car tyre will pick up the, the, the spores, transport it somewhere else and somewhere else and splash it back onto the, the verge. So there are particularly uh, abundance of certain saprophytic mushrooms growing um, right next to roads because humans, and paths as well, not just roads, also paths uh, where, where humans and dogs just, just spread the spores around really. When you've got something like honey fungus um, and you've got that whole woodland structure, obviously there's a lot going on under the soil that we don't know about. Is there much known about how the kind of the mycelium of the fungi connect the whole forest together? Is there much research been done into it? That's not really my topic, and it veers off into kind of mystical woo woo. Um, <laughs> so I don't want to dismiss any of it, but there are some rather odd things that some people claim. Um, I don't know is the answer to that. There's, there's all sorts of people claiming all sorts of things. I'm not sure how much how much it's really backed up by research about yeah, yeah trees communicating with each other via fungal mycelium. Uh, yeah, it's it's a difficult subject, and we're learning more about it all the time. I'm not really qualified to speak authoritative, authoritatively about it. Um, so yeah, I'll, I'll, I think I'll leave that question <laughs> or back that one away. <laughs> Um, actually that again goes back to when we were out and about on the walk which and I asked you about how much damage you cause when you're foraging for the mushroom can you just talk a bit about how you would ethically harvest and how you would avoid causing problems well there's myths here as well in both directions there's there's some people who, who, who seem to think that foraging is a terrible thing and it's going to cause lots of damage and other people who claim it causes no damage at all and that actually picking mushrooms and moving the spores around actually helps the mushrooms it might do in some cases but i'm sure just leaving it there to do what it does naturally is usually a better thing to do mostly if people are just collecting stuff for themselves then it's not going to be a problem commercial collecting is something of a problem because suddenly you've got a profit motive so there's a limit to how much you take for yourself. You've got to process it all. You've got to dry it. You've got to freeze it. You've got to have enough space to store it. If you're getting paid for every mushroom that you pick, suddenly there's a motive to go and take everything that you can sell. Uh, and especially if you're doing that without the landowner's permission, which, which, is, which is theft. Um, that's just antisocial and uh, yeah, certainly frowned upon. Um, there's also a problem with people randomly picking mushrooms and posting pictures on the internet. There's often beginners who do this. They are, oh, I'm going to get into mushroom foraging. So they go out and they walk around a piece of woodland and they pick everything that they can see. Um, and then they post a picture on the internet and says, which one of these can I eat? Uh, the problem with that, of course, is, is that they might be picking rare stuff. They might be picking large amounts of fungi that aren't edible. It's, you know, which, which other wildlife might depend on. It's just unnecessarily damaging it's kind of mindless vandalism I, I think the worst case of this i've ever seen somebody posted a picture many years ago on my facebook page his wife had gone out and done this stripped a whole piece of woodland of every fungus that she could find and then she'd committed another sin which was well you're not even supposed to wash mushrooms if you can avoid it she stuck them all in a sink of water so he'd actually sent me a photograph of a random collection of mushrooms bobbing around in a sink of water 
including a death cap. So I could see one death cap. And I was just like, where do I start with this guy? And I did kind of rip, rip the mickey out of him a little bit. And he got extremely upset because I, I, you know, I publicly humiliated him and his wife. And I just thought, well, you know, if you're going to do something that <laughs> dumb and then post a picture on my Facebook page, then... Um, so, yeah, don't go out and pick everything. It, 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 what you really need to do is, I think this was a question you asked me earlier, how do you go about doing it? Get Make yourself a hit list of things. You need a decent book. Um, make a list of things that are common and uh, easy to identify, so you're not going to get into trouble with them, and go and try and find those. Uh, if you find lots of something else, maybe pick one or two and try and identify them. But what you really want to do is, is, is get a few of those common ones under your belt so you're feeling a bit more common, uh, confident. And then as you get more familiar, you'll, you'll start seeing things a few times and, and you're thinking, you're thinking hey, I've seen that mushroom before. And once you've seen it three or four times, you begin to, even if you don't know what it is, you realise you keep seeing the same thing. So just kind of slowly build up your knowledge. Um, but yeah, don't, don't try and go from rank beginner to absolute expert by, by just picking everything. That's, that's not the way to do it. And on that point, what are our deadliest mushrooms in the UK? Um, there's a handful of them. The most dangerous in terms of number of deaths or serious poisonings is, is far and away Amanita phalloides, the death cap, um, because it's really quite common. And it's really quite easy to mix up with edible species if you if you don't know what you're doing. Um, uh, it has uh, another very poisonous rel- relative that would cause you liver and kidney damage. One one mushroom will you know, kill you in a, in a few days. The destroying angel in the same same genus, um, but that is pure white, and um, so perhaps more distinctive and less easy to confuse with other things. There are, yeah, a handful of other species that have got very similar toxins in, but they're not very easily confused with popular edible species. Um, And then there are a few mushrooms that uh, contain chemicals that would give give you heart and respiratory failure if you ate lots of them. Uh, unlike the death cap, that does have an antidote if you've if you've got diagnosed quickly enough. In fact, um, strangely enough, the antidote to those the, 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 the toxins muscarine. The antidote is atropine, which is the poison in deadly nightshade. So technically, you you could eat the poisonous mushroom and and some deadly nightshade berries in a meal together, and the two toxins would cancel each other out. Um, I don't recommend anybody tries it though. <laughs> That's a really weird. <laughs> no wonder the witches have got a name for a, you know association with all those plants. They probably they probably did save people back in the day by counter. I wouldn't. One or I, the wouldn't other and, I wouldn't be surprised. Yeah. No, how weird. So um, the, my last question is: Has this been a good year for mushrooms? Because I think I've noticed loads this year. Uh, we started off being a terrible year. In September, I was cancelling events because there were no mushrooms at all. I had a talk in Brighton one evening and I, and I literally could not find a single mushroom to take and we had to cancel it. Um, then the rains came and there wasn't much again for about a week, two weeks after that. Since then, some species have been doing spectacularly well. Uh, parasol mushrooms in particular have mass fruiting all over England. Um, and they're particularly noticeable because they're white and very large. Uh, and there are quite a few other members of their family, the Garicaceae, um, which include Agaricus, which are the shop mushrooms, cultivated mushrooms and field mushrooms. They're doing quite well. Um, and a few others. Uh, um, there's quite a lot of penny buns around in the last, last week or so, um, uh, but there are also some other species of fungi that are usually quite common that are having quite a bad year, uh, including the death cap um, and, uh, and russulas, brittle gills, which are usually really, really common, and milk caps. There's hardly any of those around at the minute. So, yeah, in any one year, usually there are some, some species that will have a good time and some that will have a bad time. Um, it just happens this year that the species which are fruiting well are members of the Garicaceae, which are white, large, a lot of the fruit in grassland, so they are more noticeable than some of the kind of less showy woodland species. 
And I guess the parasols are quite dramatic as well, aren't they? So well, you, the, yeah, the par- I mean, there's, where we run our courses, there's a, there's a sheep field with two massive rings of parasol mushrooms, 30 or 40 metres across. And, you know, each of these mushrooms is, is several inches across and they must have been four or 500 of them in, the, in one field. Um, you don't see that very often. Um, so I wouldn't say overall it's a particularly amazing year for mushrooms, it, but it is a good year for mushrooms making themselves visible. They're, mm. they're, they're noticeable this year. Do they have any nutritional kind of value? Yes, they do. They don't have a lot of carbohydrate. Carbohydrate we tend to find, in, and calories obviously, those tend to appear in in structures which are used for storage. So we get them in, in, in potatoes uh, or seeds. Um, mushrooms aren't that. They're a structure, reproductive structure. Um, so they, they contain some protein and quite a lot of, of, of minerals, as we say, which is, can be good or bad, depending on what they've picked up. Some vitamins. So they're definitely a, a useful part of a balanced diet but they don't contain much in the way of, of, of carbohydrate and calorie. Perfect. And if anyone was interested in finding out more about your work or your courses, where could they go and find out? Uh, come to my website, www.jeffdan.co.uk. It's probably the best place to start. I'd like to thank Jeff for sharing his expertise and for being so generous with his knowledge. Do check out his website. His blog is really interesting and you'll find links to his book and the courses he runs which includes one on foraging for seaweed, which sounds brilliant. And if anyone wants to know what to get me for Christmas, you know. When we were walking around the woods and fields looking at mushrooms, I asked Jeff if you could conceivably create a garden in which to grow mushrooms. He told me it wasn't something he'd really thought about, but in practice it might be difficult. Which got me thinking about how Roots and All has developed since it began, which was as a garden podcast. I realise over the past year or so, I've embraced the gardening aspect because that's my professional background, but that I also find myself more and more drawn to topics that don't tie into conventional gardening as the majority of people view it. I never wanted to embrace the word gardening or be pinned down by it, even from the beginning. If you look at the website that I wrote the copy for when I started out, you'll see I replaced the word gardening with terms like green spaces as much as possible, because I've always felt that gardening is a limiting term and has connotations that aren't necessarily that helpful to those who find themselves practising gardening as a hobby or a career. Because we're much more than gardeners, we're protectors of nature. We're people who work in and design green spaces. We're chefs, we're artists and creators. We're connecting in a spiritual way with our surroundings. We're scientists. We're so much more than the term gardener has come to represent. So I hope you don't mind my many tangents, and to be honest, I can't see them stopping any time soon. And I hope you're happy to accompany me on this journey. And if you have any clever ideas as to what I can use to replace the term gardener or garden with, please get in touch. Thanks very much for listening and I'll catch you next Tuesday. You can download or listen to the podcast direct from the website www.rootsandall.co.uk where you'll also find my blog and a sign up form for the newsletter which gives you a weekly roundup of content plus the inside scoop on things like upcoming guests. Or you can subscribe wherever you normally get your podcasts. Email me with comments and feedback at podcast at rootsandall.co.uk. Follow me on Twitter, Roots and All, Facebook, Roots and All UK, and Instagram, Roots and All Pod. But please also check out my Patreon, where you can make a one-off donation or take out a monthly subscription to help support my work, because if you like what I do, please help me to continue doing it. Even if you make a one-off donation of a pound, trust me, it all helps and I will be immensely grateful. So please go to Patreon and search for Roots and All.